Hello, everyone. Hi, Tara. Hi. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> fix the screen a little bit. I want to, um, it's a great pleasure to have you today and to inaugurate our uh, pop-up Q&A series. And we're very excited to have you as our very first guest. I'm excited to talk to other people <laughs> for a few yes. minutes. Yes. Good. Good. Well, the way we put this together is um, with a group of students, we came up with some, a list of, um, I think, very general and open-ended questions. Question. Answer them as, as you wish. Um, so, should we begin? Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. What is your most vivid memory from childhood? Vivid. Um, I have some vivid memory or early memory. That's all it's tricky. However you want to answer it. I have some very early memories that I uh, always sort of hold on to. And I remember even as I was somewhat young, remembering that I wanted to hold on to a moment. Yeah. So, which one? There's a few that blur together. The ones that have come to mind most um, recently in this sort of pandemic panic time that we're in is a memory of going to Yosemite. I grew up in Stockton, California, before we moved to Georgia. So I have this kind of California childhood. And um, we went to Yosemite, my older brother, older sister, and my parents and I, and I was about two and a half or three. And I remember a lot of that trip, um, but the thing that I've been thinking about a lot are the bears that I never actually saw, um, but we were having a picnic and it was dusk. So people came over to our camping site and said that there were bears in the area and we should get out. And wow. I just remember the hurry to like pack up the burgers or whatever, and they put me in the car first. And so I was just sitting in the car with a, like a, with a non-eaten hamburger on a paper plate on my lap, terrified, just petrified. And, you know, I just, I couldn't eat. And I just, I just kept imagining the bears. And I, apparently from that time forward, for a while, if you said the bears, I would get upset. Yeah. I would say that's a very photographic moment. <laughs> So maybe related, maybe not. What is your first aesthetic awakening in terms of having an oh. artistic um, inkling of some sort? Well, I feel like I have a lot of firsts in a way, but I, I you know, like I can sort of chart like there's this thing that, you know, there's like early, early childhood moments of like, this, you know, having art as a, as a possibility because of, of my father teaching in the art. Uh, program at a uh, university in California. But I think the real awakenings happened later and they had more to do with sort of the, the sort of feeling of either rejection of certain norms or, you know, the sort of status quo of what I had come to expect as art making. Um, one of the first was uh, also on a trip in San Diego. We went to a gallery that had a Warhol show up and I was probably about 12, uh, and there were, you know, suit cans on the wall. I'd seen Warhols before, but I think the seeing this show, and my dad was really dismissive of it, you know? <laughs> it was really like, yeah, he's a really weird guy, kind of. It was kind of like this, this ironic sort of pop gesture. There was no feeling to it, and I was like, interesting, you know? Because it felt really true in some way. It felt like there was something very matter-of-fact and very true about something that I couldn't really name. Um, so then I got obsessed with Andy Warhol for a period in my you know, teenage years. Are there um, any other early influences um, when you're coming of age as an artist? Artist that... I'm still coming of age. Sure. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't given up <laughs> on what I need to learn. Um, Early, 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 early. Could be filmmakers too, or, or writers yeah. from that time. 
Yeah. There's, there's a, okay. Okay. I feel like, okay. Here we go. <laughs> there's a writer. I never finished the book. Uh, I was too young for it at the time. Uh, Maxine Hong Kingston. She was from mm -hmm. Stockton. And she wrote a book called Chinaman. Yeah. Um, and I got her autograph. And I can't find that book anywhere anymore. But I thought that, that yeah, I remember trying to read it and thinking there's something very important here. I mean, I was probably 11 or 12. So, you know, it was probably within my wheelhouse. But I just didn't finish. Um, I started it a couple of times. Um, Alice Walker, I read shortly after that because my mom had um, the color of purple floating around. So I, that was my education. When we moved to Georgia, I basically was the new girl in school and hunkered down with my head down and just read Alice Walker in whatever classes I was supposed to be doing other things in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of those women writers were really important and I didn't really know why or how, you know, what, or what I wasn't planning on doing anything with that. I think I always somehow thought that I was going to be making art in some way, right. making pictures, paintings or something. But um, uh, yeah, and then I, I did kind of hold on to the Warhol thing for a while, although what I was looking for was maybe, it still sort of baffles me. Is your artwork in any way autobiographical, do you believe? Or what is the relationship between the, the maker of artwork and the thing that hangs on the wall? Or, um, well, it's never wholly separate from the thing, you know? And even I played sort of just some narrative games and sort of positioning myself as a kind of a, a character who is, yeah. you know, obstructed partly by myself, partly by my own history, partly by history and, you know, the sort of culture that we live in, to, um, I think without being able to sort of play that game or have that distance, I might not really make the work that I want to see. Mm -hmm. um, there are times when uh, I'm, you know, the process that I usually kind of adhere to when I'm trying to, trying to work on a work is um it comes from all here you know it's very sometimes very spontaneous sometimes there's writing and sketching and doodles and there's a kind of a uh, reckoning of just oneself myself um that's that's ongoing and you know a, 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 a question about self that i never seem to get to the bottom of um but it's less interesting to me to make work that's just about myself yeah. um, even though it comes up from time to time and there are sort of parables that I can apply to like you know, family dynamic and whatever. What role does humor play in your work? Um, what role does humor play in my work? If any. It's hard to keep an audience laughing. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I guess it's there isn't it? I um I I didn't I'm I I am oh let's talk about Charles Schultz for a minute just to backtrack. Oh, I like that. Okay, good. <laughs> Question of influences. Yeah, that's a good one. The um the yeah the child that I am and and was. Um, really had a thing for peanuts. I mean, I liked all cartoon strips. I liked peanuts. I liked Bugs Bunny. Um, I had my, my particular favorites from the different sort of, you know, uh, animation houses of the world. And, um, you know, Snoopy, Trickster, Bugs Bunny, Trickster. And I really wanted to be a cartoonist as a child. Interesting. Uh, I had my own little universe of characters and you know, I mean, I look back really, really, I mean, I don't even look back. I just, I have some of these little notebooks and things and I, I, they're all incomplete. I was very terrible about, you know, following through punchlines. Who needs them? You know, we just, we're just getting, I just wanted to have the whole, I wanted the, I wanted the, all the stuff that came with the Saturday morning cartoon yeah. was my, that was my ambition, yeah. you know? So I would make uh, audio recordings, um that went with like a booklet you know so you could 
like turn the page and hear like uh, hear the dialogue with sound effects. Um, How old were you when you made those? Seven, eight, something like oh, that. Goodness. You still have them? No, <laughs> I wish I I can still picture this orange oh. cassette tape, but I I know where to be found. Um, anyway, so where does humor come from? I think that um, at my innermost heart, I'm just this goofball kid, yeah. you know, and I think that the goofball kid part of me is what emerges even when I'm looking at situations and histories that are not the least bit funny. Well, that brings up my other sort of the oppositional question and how do you use sadness and pain in your work and how does that play off? Right, I mean, I think yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's a, side by side. And I, a lot of sadness and pain in peanuts too, right? Yeah, really more so as I get older, I'm just yeah. like, man, it is depressing. Yes. <laughs> Social biography a couple of years ago. So yeah. I had to put the um, nice intellectual looking bookshelf as the backdrop here. So well, that, it's very impressive. Thanks. I'm trying I love to actually that. keep them now. That's my, my goal for this <laughs> containment period is to read all those books. But yeah, I found it too um too sad. Joel Schultz's biography. Oh wow. There's a movie there, don't you think? A biopic? Mm -hmm. should, somebody should make a biopic of his life, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean it was, it's not so much as sad, it's kind of boring. <laughs> That's all our lives are. <laughs> yeah, trying to do his best. And then it all came out in subconscious, you know, uh, uh, the, the irrepressible spirit. And yeah. Uh, I also share a birthday with, with Charles Schultz. Um, wow, this is getting very. Tina Turner. This so, is getting very interesting. More and more interesting. That was my sort of spirit guides. Wow. What is your least favorite part of the artistic process for you? Artistic. Um, the thing you dislike the most, or the, the hardest, maybe the most frustrating. Um, well, I mean, the, the artistic process is that, what does that mean? That's like, because there's like, there's the studio, I have a studio, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I what? At a studio, let's say I'm in between studios, and I can't. Anyway, you don't need to know that right now. No. Um, so, studio you want to everything. is is hard in its own special way, but that's my choice. You know, like I yeah. choose to make the work that I want to make, and I'm looking, you know, I'm thinking about, it, I'm trying not to not make that work. So that's hard, but that's not impossible. I think the, the things that have become increasingly challenging in you know in the course of this career. Uh, been like art fairs and mm. these kind of art world expectations that have metastasized. And, you know, I, I've never really, I've never really been good at sort of catching on to what is demanded of me a lot of the time. So I, I, I either am a bit slow or I'm running behind or, you know, I've been working with the same gallery for, you know, 25 years or something like that, which has been good. So they generally just kind of leave me alone, but they ask nicely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, they have something. But I, it's it's an irritant in a way because it's not like, I think that I, I kind of had the expectation that things would be a little bit more, if there were gonna be shows, then you'd have some sort of control over it. You create a kind of a, a body of work or a story or narrative or a thing you're, you're sort of addressing and then it kind of goes into the world you know at once yeah. and that's does all all the different types of work that it does it's right. you know it engages in different ways and then maybe there's the sales thing which lives over here but now it's like with fairs it's like the sales thing is just right there yeah and it's just demanding that you, you know, fulfill that need globally. <laughs> what is the part of the artistic process you like the best in terms of the moments? 
of engagement for you, which is where it feels you know, at most content or happiest, I guess. Together and it's just like flowing so so gorgeously. It's it's like a uh, in a in a funny way. I'm having a little bit of one of those right now. Um, and Gregory, maybe you know something of this because. Um, it's just because we're older um <laughs> you know i was like hmm not so much to do not so many emails it's kind of like 1996 yeah. you know <laughs> like it's kind of like no we don't have you know like i could actually do it it's funny because there's a paranoia on the other side of like well will anything ever happen ever again and yeah. you know we have all the cancel plans but um, I've been reading, like I said, it's like picking th something up and having a, I had a, an a, a aborted idea from six years ago. Not an idea, just kind of like a thought and a bubble. And I was like, oh, I'll investigate. I don't know what it'll turn into, but I should do some reading on, you know, this little nugget. Of it. Yeah. And, and then oh, six years ago. You know, like, <laughs> like, and I sort of did this other stuff, and look, so everything feels like I'm sort of halfway doing what I want to do in order to sort of fulfill the demands of, you know. The what are the um, artists of your generation you most admire? Who who are the artists of your generation that you most feel like you learn from and admire and respect? Oh, who's my generation? There's so many people of, of multiple generations that you know I, that I have. Your, your, your peer group, I, I guess, or your. Um... I'll come back around to that one because I can't ever answer that question, even when it's like artists of the past and artists. Of the, yeah. and it's not that I admire other artists. I can never remember who the artists are that I. Yeah who are like lodged in my thinking yeah you know, like i can name a bunch of names but it would seem sort of disingenuous because i'm looking at adina lawson yes awesome <laughs> but fantastic come back around anyway. what is it do you have a favorite movie or a favorite book or a favorite I work of art <laughs> <laughs> i'm really Gladiator. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great. Love well, Gladiator. That's my, my why. Why? I go to. Um, what is it about that movie? And you know, there's just those moments when um, the, the the kind of hero, you know, the noble hero, who, who does right by by the. Wow. You know, the slave who becomes the warrior who, who saves the world. I wow. don't know. That movie just gets you. Gets me. That one and Spirited Away. Ah, uh, yes. Beautiful. Do you have a favorite book um, or on that bookshelf? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I uh, like, uh, well, what about Invisible Man? Great. Well, that's a that's a one to return to often. Yeah. Um, Great choice. How about a work of art? Oh, sorry, Fun Home by um, Alison Bechtel. I just recommended that to some, lent that to somebody recently, also. And um, what else? A favorite work of art. Hmm. That one's tricky because there's just too many, too many. and things can get to you at different, you know, like for instance, that show that was up at the Whitney, uh, you know, the Mexican muralist and their influence on American art, I cried throughout the show. I just walked through it in tears um, for many reasons, you know, partly, you know, just the, the, the importance of so much of that work and the, and the, and the bravery of the artists making it and the idiot, idiocy of the people censoring it and the relevance of the of 
you know, what these artists are talking about to right now and yeah. the question about, you know, whether art, if artists make political work and, you know, it, if it falls on deaf ears, does that mean nothing changes? And if it is seen, does anything change? And, I, you know, I just felt really, I was just moved. That's interesting because it anticipates one of my questions was, which was, is there a work of art that has made you cry? Many. Uh, many. And it's strange because the things that, you know, like it, because of, it was also the cumulative effect of things, so halfway through, maybe even a quarter of the way through that exhibition, and, um, and you know, there's reproductions of work, and I was thinking about, um, you know, figurative art, which is kind of always a, a bugaboo in, in my head somehow. Like, I, I always feel like, it is the thing that I should not be doing, it, you know, like the uncool, it's like the uncool cousin of contemporary art. And I just keep on going there. Um, and so it was something about seeing figure, the figure represented. And then there's this one, Jacob Lawrence, he, uh oh, sorry, you went to sleep. Um, Jacob Lawrence, you know, like a yeah. tiny little um, egg tempera of the uh, washerwoman, I think. Ah, yes. It was with a little, with a little caption underneath about you know, women left behind, um, you know, doing the doing the housework or the chores, and then just and that was then. It was just, but it was after seeing like just this sort of like swirling like rage of like injustice, <laughs> and then this one sort of quiet small image and then and then I cried for the rest of the show <laughs> from that point over but it sort of helped release it somehow yeah. yeah but no I mean I I was going to preface this conversation by saying yep. you know like don't hold it against me if I cry while we're talking because I think I don't think I have uh uh the dam is an, an operation it never really was yes now you understand that uh this might be an unanswerable question, but what do you see as the central preoccupations in your work as you sort of map out your career as an artist? Like, are there that thing, that those themes that drive you? Yeah. Um. Central preoccupation. That's a good question, though. I, I feel like even when I come back to notebooks and things, I'm always asking myself some kind of a question. And the question always seems, I, it's, it's as though I want to get at the beginning of things, like to get at the origin of some schism or some you know, it could be psychological could be social that we're the moment when it all went wrong yeah and i don't know if the 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 wanting to go back and and find that split is in an attempt to change it or just to see it mm -hmm. and i'm not entirely sure but i do think that this kind of like if there's a preoccupation it's kind of with the origin story or like trying to distill this, you know, say like, I mean, and also I'm trying to find that question about the um, self, like where is the self sort of situated, you know, where is it situated in this sort of artwork? I think, yeah, the origin stories, it's partly my own origin story. Where does it, where is it that, that a thing like I, <laughs> Uh -oh, comes yeah. from You're still there. I'm here. Um, you know, and that that I is many different types of being. It's it is a construct of female, perhaps black, supposedly American, whatever. You know, they're all but everything that seems everything that's sort of assigned to me in a way seems um, um, questionable. Or, you know, possible. Sorry, I do have on pants. Um, <laughs> um, it's like, 
yeah, like a, a question mark and like, what does that mean to be these things? What does it mean to be from such and such? And what does it mean? To, what does, what does, and it, it comes back to the art and the painting. And so in a way, when I start drawing or, or sketching or writing, it is a little piece of that question. Like what, what is the beginning point where this becomes an artwork? Or what is the beginning point where this leaves the realm of the thought or a feeling or sentiment and enters the world of communication, enters the world of, of sharing, enters the world of, of, you know, all of us together. Which brings me to another movie Good. recommendation, Hot Tub Time Machine. Ah, great. I'm writing that one down. Very, very underappreciated. Um, I do have a terrible weakness for the Bill and Ted's of the world and the, um, uh, what is that movie with Nicolas Cage in it? And um, Peggy Sue got married. Yes. Any, any going back in time? Back to um, the future? Too. <laughs> 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 back to the future uh there's one i think that has like nick jack black in it or like yes one or something stupid yeah. um uh, clam cave bear um that's just not really back in time it's just it is back in time back in the day um and there's another one i think that has ringo star it's really bad um yeah i like those movies that have um <laughs> The beginning of what is it about that theme or um for you that motif of going back <laughs> 2001 oh my god yeah so if you were to go back in time is that something you would want to do i mean i can't really yeah. I mean, that, that, that's this is the teenage me right here teenage yeah, me. So, yeah. oh, if i want to go back in time i really couldn't go back in time because yeah. i just did not enjoy any of the relative comforts or choices that I seem to have right now, even if they're limited uh, right, in right. another point in time. Or if I could, you know, and I and I resented actually the idea that I couldn't even have the imagination to go back in time. Mm. <laughs> My imagination was thwarted by the sort of realities of back in time. Right, right. Uh, I think uh, Octavia Butler's um, Kindred sort of helped solve some of that problem. Just, went ahead and said we're going back in time slavery days and yeah like that. who's your imagined audience or do you think about that um, when you're making yeah. your work i guess so i mean i think uh, i have a sort of kind of a hodgepodge audience that includes uh Sound pretty solipsistic, but you know, a girl, a young girl, not unlike myself, uh, you know, kind of a goofball, nerdy black girl who is interested in art and and Goya. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think he's also just there, like <laughs> wondering about uh, what it is I happen to be doing. And <laughs> that's that's right. Do you read your own reviews? Mm, not so much, no. The last time there was a review that got read, I think my mother was very upset about it. <laughs> yes, well, that. that's how it works, right? <laughs> mother is like your greatest advocate and greatest critic, right? <laughs> How has how has success affected your work? Oh, well, that is the it 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 is uh, no joke uh, when you start being able to pay your rent and not worrying quite as much. Something shifts. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I mean, I, I feel as though in 25 years or so, I've been trying to hold on to basically the same version of myself that I am. But I mean, I have a house, you know, I have things. And, and so I think that the, the, the change from 
had an answer for this actually before we got on this call. Let me just think about it for a minute. <laughs> it has to do with um, sort of the, there's a fear, I guess, of not having things that you know, of not getting a show, or of not you know, a, a sort of a hunger. Yeah that arises from that fear, you know, a hunger to sort of like jump out of one's uh, comfort zone real fast and like make something. And I guess I was thinking about it these last couple of weeks because it reminded me of being, I lived in Providence after I finished grad school at RISD and I kind of stayed there for a little while even though things were happening for me elsewhere in New York. And I, um, I decided, you know, it would be better to you know, stay in, in my inexpensive lodging. I didn't really have a studio, but I just remember that feeling of like weeks, several weeks of kind of like, you know, what am I doing? And then like that kind of fear, like just do something, like, do it now. Like if it's going to be, if it doesn't feel right, because you don't have the space to make this thing, do this thing, you know, and if you don't have, and so that, that kind of like compression of like, of, Sort of fear and desire was really palpable for me, and it, and it wasn't about so much like keeping myself fed or keeping you know like family happy or anything like that. It was just like it was like very solitary kind of yeah. And I think the the changes that have occurred. I mean, I still have a pretty small operation. I have two studio assistants. Um, one does clerical stuff, one is more hands-on, but mostly hands-off because I'm terrible and I just want to do everything myself. And um, you know, the overhead is a little more because I live in New York, I'm not traveling yes. to Rhode Island. Right. And, um, and like I said, I have been working with the same gallery, so the, the anxiety has, I haven't really had this some of the problems that I encounter now with, with I've flirted with some other galleries in yeah. working like overseas and whatever, and it's very different. And I'm not sure if I like, you know, the, the kind of attitude that they approach the sort of kid, kid gloves yes. <laughs> <laughs> that they treat me with. How have you learned, or what have you learned through failure? or i don't know the meaning of it yeah <laughs> even uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, i have this very terrible um i know this is being recorded so i should probably oh, yeah. um, it's, it's fine your There's, secrets are safe huh your secrets are safe the secrets are safe with everybody who watches yeah. this yeah uh, uh, a scholar who I know has written a book ostensibly about failure, which I received a copy of and I read. And then I basically drew and painted on every single page of it because I was so annoyed with the book. Uh -huh. And I was annoyed with the book, not because it was about failure, but because it was about success. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> masking itself as failure. Oh, this person did this and then they failed and they tried again and they failed. And I was just like, what about the things that just fucking don't go anywhere? You know, like what about that ever happened for you? Like yeah. things, ideas that I mean the 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 joke in a way that I have about I have the show that's still up in the gallery <laughs> that's closed. Yeah. yeah. The work is on the wall. <laughs> yeah, the work is up and there's a lot of it. Um, so the show is basically... Where is that, by the way? Oh, sorry. It's Sikkim and Jenkins. Yeah. And so I, I, the, the full arc of it is that I have a show, had a show in uh, Switzerland that was set to open in May of this year at yeah. the yeah. museum in, in Basel. And I thought about it for a while. It was going to be about, it was just going to be a drawing show, some kind of drawing. I didn't know if I wanted to do new work for it or too much new work. And, and I had been going through my boxes of stuff. I was basically moving some things into storage and, and I kept opening up boxes because I had things that I've moved from Georgia to 
Rhode Island to Maine to New York. And I was like, okay. Uh, anyway, so I was going through the boxes and I found some treasures, childhood treasures. And then I found just so much stuff. Like I just, I kept, you know, I, I kept up this habit for years of, of this hundred drawings project that was a mm -hmm. grad assignment. And so, you know, when I, things felt a little um, like cloudy or uh, if I just wasn't sure where my head was, I would um, do 100 drawings wow. or thereabouts. And um, anyway, so I'm sorry, I've lost everybody's pictures. So I don't know if you're still there. We're all here. Okay. All right. Yeah. Are you? Do you yeah, see me? I see you now. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so anyway, what I'm saying is I had all these drawings and I thought, well, maybe my show will just be all just like gather a thousand drawings for my past. Because the yeah. choice is either to look at these and see them, you know, I, I couldn't see them for what they were. I couldn't figure out why I saved some of them. I was like, it's not a good drawing, or is it? Like, I can't tell anymore because some part of me felt compelled to keep it and not just throw it away and to keep all of its brothers or they were, sometimes they were related to uh, a body of work that was in a show, but then I held these ones back. I didn't really hold them back for sales or anything. I just held them back because they did something for me. So the show is that. The show is sort mm. of archival. Some some is notes. Some is you know, some note, like written notes. There are things that were just like image files. Like you know, you go through and I would just pull out a file folder from 1980. I'm not 1998, and we're like, oh, look at all these things that I was thinking about doing yeah. in 1990 or thinking about thinking about and so I sort of put all that together for the show in Switzerland and then we did a mini version of it in the gallery uh, at Sycamore which just opened on the 5th. My goodness. Um, yeah. Well it was fine I was happy to get it all done. I mean it was a, a big cataloging effort so it's, a, it's, it's not possible to see. Yeah they made a um, an e-catalog actually. Oh um, so people so could students to could go yeah. to it. Yeah, you can go to it. It's sort of e catalog, so there's some um, views of the installation. There's new work also, but there's also a lot of smaller groupings of work. I think the earliest work was may there were maybe two or three pieces from 1993 or four, and then it just kind of like it's a sort of a, a funny array of. And, and it is really talking about the origin search, it is really me attempting to make the connections between, you know, myself now, myself 10, 15, 20 years ago, to see if, you know, what, what, what has changed, what has grown, what is consistent. Um, I, and I guess I'm looking for somebody else to give me the answer because I'm, you know, the eye can't see itself. I'm sure it's there in the work. <laughs> Yeah. where it always hides in plain sight. What is your favorite guilty pleasure? Um, dirty Rock. Yeah, good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very, it's been there for me for a number of traumatic exhibition experiences. You've seen every episode, I take it, or? A couple times. Yeah, a couple of times. I'm, I'm back on season two again right now on YouTube. Oh, wow, <laughs> so great. What is your greatest fear? Well, we're in stage one of it. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, For years, my greatest fear was some kind of uh, involuntary confinement. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> right, are. And, um, you know, whether that was, you know, a prison environment or something else, some other kind of captive situation. And uh, whether, you know, like a war or something where you're in, in, unable to exercise free will. So um, here we are. Yeah. What do you think the artist's job is in a time of crisis? Well, that is a question that gets asked every time there's a crisis, and um, there have been quite a few of them. 
centuries of them, but lately it seems like they're fast and furious. Um, I've heard that the artist's job is to make work, but I think that in that idea of making work, it's also because we are supposed to be able to think creatively in challenging situations, maybe to evaluate what that work is that, that one makes. You know, if that work is, I know um, one of my studio assistants is making masks. Yeah. Um, maybe that work is um, taking care of. <laughs> 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 sorry. Uh, <Okay>. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Serious stuff. Um, yeah, so what you know, during Hurricane Katrina, sometimes the work is, you know, building houses, sometimes the work is, you know, going in. Um going to Iraq and drawing, you know, what one sees there. That was another good show that just closed at the beginning of May at the PS1. The, uh, yeah. What was that show called? The show. Anyway, sorry. Um, I'm getting my portrait taken as we're doing this right oh, now. Wow. So I'm that's, very, <laughs> very distracting. That's very. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, I want to see that portrait. Maybe we, that's I, true. maybe we could. Polaroid, so yeah, is that Ari there? Yeah, yeah, say hi so from, all, from all of us. Yeah, hello. <laughs> <laughs> do you go to do you go to works of art, uh, for solace, for hope? Oh, for... kind of. I mean, I mentioned Goya before, but terms of. And then the, what I've, I've got this um, little reading pattern right now that's sort of helping me think about, because, it, okay, so the, the, let me tell you about my book club, <laughs> book club of one. I posted it on my Instagram, but, and it just sort of, it, it emerged out of this project or this kernel of an idea from six years ago that I was talking about, but not actually telling you what that kernel is because I'm still holding up for myself. Right. But basically it has to do with nature and confinement or nature and you know the question of uh, wilderness and society and how people in different socioeconomic brackets, different ethnic groups, whatever, find themselves in contention with either nature or um, the state in some way that exercises their will to be free. Um, and, but I'm also really, really, really interested in how um, particularly myself, but also African-Americans and or other people of color interact with nature as, you know, it's often sort of handed to or we're often sort of given this idea of nature as a sort of benevolent, sort of beautiful something that, you know, in, either enriches us or gives us something or that is despoiled. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And in, in any case, um, the reading, I, you know, I was reading a book about a couple that lost, got lost in the Amazon, and then another mm -hmm. book about a uh, boy soldier in uh, Sierra Leone, and this other underground railroad narrative and while i was reading the underground railroad narrative because you know you find these little parallels in this just in little details of the experiences people have like sleeping in a tree or you know avoiding snakes or avoiding you know capture or trying to find a rescuer and um and i was thinking about this when i was reading the underground railroad book i was reminded of this painting by this African-American, 19th century African-American painter named Robert Duncanson. Mm. And um, he didn't do a lot of work, but I think there's, there's a couple pieces maybe at the Detroit Art Institute. And they're very strange, like kind of Hudson River Valley kind of school, like lush landscapes and like very 
sort of minute people. And there's his famous painting is uh, Uncle Tom and Little Ava. And they're like kind of yeah. small characters in this sort of beautiful, beautiful landscape. So, I mean, I do think, you know, just looking at pictures, looking at paintings and, and photos, paintings I think really do it for me sometimes. Um, you know, if, you know, reproduction of a painting is just as good when you can't get out and see the real painting. Uh -huh. And, um, so uh, this is my, this is the very last question. So it's, um, what advice would you give students, particularly in this moment of peril? Don't panic. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hard. Oh, but. Um, take little bites. Oh, <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Little bites, you know, um, the, the moment when we're through this will be different, probably. Um, but I think to sort of take little bites in the present a little something. It's a great answer. I'm going to ask all the students to turn on their video um, and their audio so we could all thank thank Kara. Here they come. Oh wow. Oh that's me. I don't know how that <laughs> uh, you could put it on gallery view. See everyone. There are a lot of them. Some of them are in apartments. Put a round of applause. Thanks.